Hello. Hello, good morning. Hi, good morning. Good afternoon. <laughs> good evening. How are you? Doing well, thanks. Um, in San Francisco, the smoke from the fires is finally cleared, maybe just for today. But even if it's just for today, it's a blessing. All windows open and Oh, you're having a, I was not aware of the situation there. Oh. So yeah. there are a, a heat, heat wave, is it, or something? No, major wildfires have been burning for a month. Um, and so the air quality has been not very breathable since mid-August. Gosh. Yeah, it's been a long time. <laughs> so, so many things happening around the world. Yeah, since, yeah. since, since, since we lost, yeah, since August, I guess. Yeah. All right. Who do we have here? We have four people online, and we have a, a few minutes to go. So how's it been at Slack? Right, a month is a very, very long time. I guess you've got a few, a few, a few more users on the platform. <laughs> we, we have at that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. And we've revamped the onboarding flow. Um, I just went few, through it a few weeks ago for the first time in many months, and it's uh, it's much easier to get started now. I think. Yeah, it's it's like to me, just as a user, it's so impressive how how there's continuous improvement, and 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 literally they 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 sort of anticipate, not just Slack, they anticipate what the user needs. It's like. I think a lot of a lot of hard work and testing. Okay, let's see. Is anyone else joining us today? Yes, Ankar Oberoi on our team is. Yes, okay, all right. Hey, hey, Anka. Hi. Hello. Can you all hear me? Because I'm standing a little further away from my mic. OK, cool. Very good. OK, so a couple more people are joining. And um, I think we should get started as soon as possible, right? We're going to take up anyone's time unnecessarily. So uh, welcome, everyone, to the uh, Slack Roundtable, some really experienced speakers. Um, the topic today is building an API strategy for business and tech users. So it's going to be covering um, um, the Slack design APIs, and we'll discuss how to build and uh, keep the developers happy, but at the same time, also appeal to the, uh, the non-technical users. And I, I think that's the amazing thing about the Slack platform, uh, using it for this event as well, is how easy it is to use. Uh, we don't need to know so much. Now, for the, um, for the speakers, um, I mean, really experienced people here. We've got Bear Douglas, who's head of developer relations at Slack. And, well, I, you help vast numbers of developers, right, um, uh, get on board on this platform, but also, you know, all different types of developers, those who are enthusiasts and those who may be just experimenting and don't know what to do with it. So really interesting job. Um, Kazuhiro san, a partner engineer and SDK developer. So, into the and um, very experienced software uh, developer with a lot of uh, enthusiastic topics around Scala 
and other development languages. I mean, so many here, Ruby, Java, um, and also into the architecture and frameworks. So a lot, lot of experience. And um, finally, we've got Anchor, um, who is the developer tools lead, is what I have here, right? So <laughs> I didn't get a uh, developer relations manager, developer's tools lead. So, you know, I'd be happy if you could elaborate on that, because I, I don't have much else. Let me see. Um, well, I, I see that you're also an experienced developer um, and focusing on user experience, helping the system scale, and so forth. And an entrepreneur, right? Interested in entrepreneurship. So maybe that everything. would add. <laughs> a little Sorry? bit of everything. Yeah, so I guess that would add a, another dimension to it, thinking about the non technical user. So we've got hard techie, we've got a, a sort of a, a hybrid, and then we've got someone who's driving community. All right. So, so on this topic today, we've had questions come in, and it would also be um, fantastic to get questions or interactions. From, from anyone who's joined here. And I see a few more people have joined. Uh, Christine, Christiane, uh, Claire, Connie. So I don't see too much detail here. But I see lots of different roles, business roles and technical roles. So yeah, so that's enough from me. Um, I would like to uh, just kick it off by asking uh, Bear, you know, uh, a few questions, right? Um, and I, I think from, from the introduction, it, it's, you know, since we last met in August, what's been happening? You know, are you driving engagement from developers using Slack for the platform? Or are they flooding you with questions? How, how, how is the dynamic working? It's always meant to be a bit of a push-pull, right? Like, we want to engage developers by giving them, you know, the inside scoop into what's happening with the latest platform releases and chatting with them about their designs. So to that extent, we do push information out to the community, but we also spend a lot of time listening to what people need from us, what we should incorporate into our roadmap down the line and, and what people are interested in seeing from us in three, six, nine months time as well. So it's, it's always a little bit of both. And it certainly helps with everyone being far flung and not able to meet in person that we do have both the Slack workspace for people to meet up in and uh, online meetups that are happening uh, through slackcommunity.com. Yeah, because uh, these, are, these are questions, by the way, which came in before the event. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, make, I'm not making them up. It's, it's also actually a, a general question about what, what developer relations does as well, because I'm, I'm not sure people really understand that so whilst we're on that topic. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a title that means very different things at different companies, kind of like project manager. It can mean a lot of different things. At Slack, mm -hmm. developer relations is inside the product team. And what we work on are, for example, our SDKs and developer tools. We write our developer documentation that's on api.slack.com. And then we also run programs for uh, engineers at other companies that we're trying to help with their integrations that are going on to the app directory. So that's working with, you know, Polly and Donut and all of those great Slack first companies and, and tools, all the way up to Atlassian and, and that, that level of company working on their type of tooling as well. And then we also work with customers who are building integrations for Slack that are just for their own team. So we sort of run the gamut when it comes to helping people technically, building products for them and spending a lot of time talking to them. Okay, so I think that's really representative of the whole of a community as such. And so from the point of view of the questions that we've had coming in, and of course, if there's any online, um, I suppose the key one coming in here, and it's been a theme through a lot of the round tables and even the topics, is balancing like the readiness of API from the simple question of are we ready to even consider API economy or API tooling to what the, what the business needs. So I, I won't um, necessarily call out anyone in particular, but how do you balance between the customer need and the product features, right? Uh, for example, with, with, with Slack. Mm. So who would want to pick that one up? Mm. Or maybe? Sure, yeah. So um, yeah, I think the crux of this question is like, sometimes in order to do a really high quality API, you have to slow down and not necessarily mm. try to deliver, you know, big new releases every week or every, month or every quarter, or there's a little bit more thoughtfulness that goes into each specific update that you make. And I think it's a good um, kind of tension to point out here. And I think 
Um, resolving that tension is really about understanding the needs of your developers or your customers or your users, whatever the audience might be, and trying to find the right balance. So as a lot of things that you'll probably hear, uh, the answer is here is it depends. But we, we've done some cool things uh, within Slack that I think really help us um, strike the right balance. One of which is we have a uh, committee internally for advising on API changes. And this is an intentional, like potentially slowdown of delivery. But what it does is it increases the quality and consistency of the APIs that we end up releasing for our customers. So we know that's really important for them. So that that's like one example of an, uh, of an organizational thing that we've done to try and make sure that we're striking the right balance and meeting our customers' needs as we understand them. Wow, that's, that's interesting because you're mentioning the word tension, right? So that's something you can feel, right? Something, you know, maybe a resistance in the in the business side. How, how do you see the tensions? How would you describe that? And, and the need to slow down because if there's a tension, sometimes the tendency is to rush through it and push through it. But what I'm hearing is the opposite. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's there's hundreds of good ideas. There's a lot of brilliant people that work at Slack, always experimenting, always coming up with new things. And, and we all want to put those awesome new fun things in the hands of our users and our customers. Um, so the tension is really about like, we have like a million and one good ideas, but we can't do a million and one different things all at the same time. We have to kind of be intentional about um, which are the big, biggest impact and which are the ones that will deliver the most value to our customers. And I think it takes a lot of work to, uh, and I lost a lot of cross-functional work. So DevRel, who we have represented here today, is one part of the equation. But we work really closely with product managers, with engineers, with our customers and our customer success and sales organizations to try and build a picture that we all kind of agree on and, and kind of prioritize based around that picture. And uh, you know, it's it's constantly being refined because as an organization, we grow and we have new kinds of customers and new kinds of needs and new kinds of strategy. So we have to evaluate that every once in a while. Okay, so it's an energetic tension at Slack. Yeah. I, <laughs> I could imagine like a lot of financial services and of course other, other sectors here, but from the financial services, there was a talk yesterday about governance. So the tension was kind of, was a bit different, um, you know, where, where maybe the business is a bit more conservative. So another question is why, you know, why does a business need an API strategy? Some of the, uh, some of the people may not be so enthusiastic. So I just wonder, wonder on, on your thoughts on that. It's one of the questions we had. Well, in Slack's case, our, our ecosystem of apps is extremely important to us. We know that Slack does a few things very, very well. Uh, it enables collaboration between people at companies, but we know that we are not, for example, a design tool that's as good as Figma, and we will never be. It's not what we're good at. It's not what the, the folks who are building Slack can build. So it's extremely important to us as a business to enable that interoperability with all of these best in class tools from other companies to make sure that our customers, our mutual end customers, have this cohesive experience of their workday that is really the vision that we're trying to deliver on. So without an API strategy, our business strategy doesn't make as good sense. So luckily, in our case, they, those are not uh, tensions. They're, they're not in any sort of conflict that we need to navigate. They, they certainly uh, help each other in a feedback loop. Yeah, so from, from a business evaluating uh, API strategy, uh, really the question was kind of like, um, why do they need it? I, I guess it's up to them to answer that question. But from, from Slack's point of view, I mean, Slack can be used without going into advanced features, right? So I, yeah. I guess that, that, that would be one aspect of it. Right. The business may not have an API strategy, but they could still be using Slack. And then as their needs evolve using it, they may then want the more premium services. Got it. Yes. Uh, I, th I think we were, I might have misinterpreted the question that we were talking about yeah. any business who was thinking about creating an API for their own services and talking about Slack's reasoning for creating an API for our services. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, I, was, I was thinking more about a business. You know, a lot of the questions are around, I'm, I'm running this business or so I'm representing IT and I, I want to start using the technology, but the business somehow has got the tension where it's saying, we don't need all this stuff. We don't need all this stuff. So in that respect where Slack can help, help, help a business mature to, 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 to start an API strategy. Sure, yes, we can help you think through what the 
integration points you need are that will help you get business done. What are the what are the types of events that are coming from various systems that you need to surface to have human attention? That's that's where we're strongest. So when you think about all the information that's getting piped between different services that you might be subscribed to, uh, which of them should be systems just talking to each other? One one event emitted by one system needs to be consumed by a different system and which need to be surfaced to human for some sort of action there. And framing that event model might help some businesses think through what their strategy should be through consuming APIs. Yeah, so, so if I was a business, I would say, okay, let's find those pockets where we've got that human interaction. Let's try something out as an experiment and let's see how that develops over time and using a platform to, to do that, maybe, maybe as an approach to coming out with a strategy. Yeah, um, yeah. okay. Um, so, so the question was actually, someone asked, what does a good API strategy look like? Well, that's a pretty open question, all right? Who, who, who shall I ask for that one? I mean, what, what's your experience on that? Yeah. So <laughs> you've been, we, like in Singapore, we call it being arrowed. I think Anchor's been arrowed on that one. Actually, because <laughs> oh, yeah, I think of course there are several problems like REST API design and Slack is more like methodology style, like a resource plus method style naming. The naming is a part of the design. Yeah, I think uh, the most important thing would be uh, keeping the background compatibility as much as possible and allowing more features uh, with a simple API and a simple interface. So that is most important. And also not only just design, but also the performance and also kind of capability to deal with so many kind of variation of use cases. So that's also a really important factor. So our engineering team and also product designer really careful, carefully designing new APIs before releasing as a GA version. Okay, so that's, quite, that's kind of like the, from, from an engineering point of view. I mean, um, from, from a, how would that align with the business, right? The, uh, the business strategy. So the engineering side can do a great job, what you just said, all the, all the backward compatibility and capability. How would that align to a business strategy? I think is part of the question. So probably, yeah, Anker and the Bear know a lot mm -hmm. from me, but the one, one thing I can share here is, um, so basically, we, sometimes, you know, not sometimes, but usually we have some partnership with other you know, service providers. So like, launching new features with other kind of launch partners. So a really good way to kind of really uh, sharing what, what, it, what it is and also how beneficial it is to you know, potential audiences. Not, 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 not just releasing features, but also the sharing the actual really working partnership and the real use cases. It's a good way to kind of uh, accelerate the adoption of the new you know, API features to businesses. Yeah, I, I guess that's coming from, from the experts, because I, I'm not sure how many integrations or how many partners you have at Slack now, but I, I, I think it might be growing on a, a pretty frequent basis. Is there, is there a favorite integration? Something? <laughs> I know I asked that last time. She said, no, 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 I cannot. Oh. You ask the product person what their favorite feature is. Um, but are there any sort of integrations sort of that you could give an example of for Slack or partnerships? Uh, so others do have some recommendations, suggestions. I, I think Bear brought up Atlassian a little bit earlier. I think it's a really interesting one. Um, so Atlassian makes a lot of amazing products. Mostly a, a lot of them are for also for technical oriented companies, but some of them like uh, their wiki product is, is usable by anybody like a non-tech and business user as well. Um, and I think the partnership between Slack and Atlassian there has been really fruitful in the sense that there's a lot of people that are Atlassian building great products to help make people bring their work life, um, excuse me, uh, to, to make their work life easier or to uh, make things easier in terms of collaboration. And they recognize the value that Slack brings to the table as well, because that's where everybody wants to communicate. And so, um, by working together and making sure that we have the right platform and they have the right integration points um, and that we have a dialogue around how to make, how to evolve together and create better integration points between these two sets of products, um, our shared customers are really enjoying the benefit. So that, it's a little bit of the business value in that conversation as well, right? Because um, 
we have an, a vision for what Slack is meant to be used for. And it doesn't exist in a vacuum. There are lots of other products and services that people use. And in order to realize the vision that we have, um, we have to acknowledge up front that there are other pieces of software that our customers want us to work with. So it's really about t realizing that vision depends on an API strategy. Yeah, thanks. Um, and, and I think it, obviously it also creates use cases and the use cases create confidence and give people more, more practical reality by working with uh, Atlassian and many other partners. And also for, for, uh, for participants here, if you, you're running a, a healthcare system or you're running a financial services system, to look um, uh, not inside out all, all the time, outside in at the, the, the API economy. Um, now, I, I'm not sure how many people are on your platform at the moment, right? But uh, clearly a lot. And there's going to be some really uh, like um, complex technical challenges. So, um, and, and delivery timeline. So one question is how to balance delivery versus quality, building quality APIs. I don't know if there, if it is a balance. How, how, what's your thoughts on this maybe, uh, Kevin? How, how to balance delivery versus building quality APIs. I guess they mean speed of delivery. Yeah, I think we touched on this a little earlier on one of the first questions, but I mean, just to kind of reiterate a little bit. Um, yeah, there, there's always going to be a kind of tension there as we talked about earlier, but um, there are ways that we can try to use our, uh, our knowledge and our understanding of what our customers need to try and deliver things at the right pace. So, uh, you know, we, we get signals as a developer relations team, we're, we're constantly talking to our developers, we're constantly trying to understand what their next set of problems they want us to solve are. And we're constantly trying to be involved in the conversation of prioritizing that. So we always have to serve as sort of a control to understand whether we're moving at the right pace and, and solving big enough problems and delivering enough value to those set of developers. And we can have that conversation with our counterparts in the engineering side or in the other business parts of the business, sorry. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of advocate for other features and other big things that we want to, to see in the API or as a feature that gets launched sooner. So, um, yeah, I think it's just about maintaining that connection to your audience and being able to um, act on the feedback that you're gaining back from there. Of course, is when you're doing a lot of new endpoints or new features for your customers, you have to keep your long-term maintenance and deprecation strategy in mind as well. Because if you have enterprise customers who are relying on your APIs, they might be a Slack customer or a customer of your business for, for 10 years. And in those 10 years, something that they built many, many years ago, ideally shouldn't break. Or if it does break, you don't want it to be breaking all the time. So when we think about making continual improvements to our APIs, we also want to keep an eye to stability. So that does put an additional pressure on the quality part of that initial release, because you have to think about, all right, how long are we going to be able to keep this API exactly the way it is? How confident are we that it's not going to change? And then in the future, if it does change, how will we move however many developers are relying on this on this API over to the latest and greatest? Gosh, lots of things to consider. Um, how about the versioning of the APIs? How, how frequently do they change? Because you talked about continuous improvement. Yeah. I can talk a little bit about that. Or, yeah, okay, cool. I'll go first, and if you guys want to add in, that's cool. Um, yeah, I think um, it's like a little non-conventional in terms of what we, how we uh, continue to evolve and to improve our API. So currently, we don't actually make an explicit version. So there's not like version one today and version two tomorrow and version three the day after that. Th this might change in the future, but so far, what's served us really well is to try and keep our APIs as stable and as backwards compatible as possible. And the reason we, we do it that way is we know that we know our audience, we know our, our set of developers, and a lot of them are people that kind of drive by, make one cool little integration for their team and set it aside and work on something else. And they probably don't have the time to come back and maintain this. I mean, there's obviously a, a group of developers out there that are constantly iterating on Slack and, and maintaining their complex apps to work with Slack. But 
for a large portion of these developers that we're working with, um, not having to update or see their integration break is actually a big part of the value they get out of the platform. And so what we're trying to do is trying to make as minimum number of changes required over time for those people as possible to, to make sure that them and their teammates gain as much value as possible. So for us, the right strategy right now is to not to version, um, but to try and work really hard at making all of our changes backwards compatible. And obviously there are some things that we can't make backwards compatible, but for those things, we, we try to take a long view on what deprecation looks like. We try to monitor our metrics in terms of how people are using those things, do outreach in terms of talking to them and asking them whether they'd consider moving to a different um, technique or a different API um, that we can support longer into the future and uh, work with them and to make sure that we actually uh, set a timeline that's for, far enough in the future that we can safely make that deprecation occur. Good. I have a question. Well, almost a question from Dimas. Uh, so I'm inviting everyone really to put their questions in the chat. Because we've got a little bit of time left and I think I've been asking a lot of questions here, albeit questions from participants. Yeah. So I'll just leave some space for that. Okay, still, still writing the question. Uh, okay, I mean, how can people reach you? Um, this is just a short catch up. Uh, how can people reach you uh, through, through today and then afterwards? I know there are platforms out there. I think it's always useful to put them in the chat and just get people to, um, to engage. Uh, a great place yeah. to uh, interact with us, but also the broader yeah. community is uh, slackcommunity.com, and I'll drop that in there as well as my Twitter handle, which is probably the best way to reach me. Yes, good. Okay. So, um, good. Um, yeah, so a bit more about the technology. I mean, okay, we've got the time. Um, in terms of de um, deprecated APIs, advantages and disadvantages of OAS3. And another maybe connected is graph HQL APIs, the, the tools and technologies that you use to, to maintain these, these APIs, manage them and utilize them. Yeah. I can so, so the advantages and disadvantages of these various technologies, for example. Mm. Sure. So Slack's API is not uh, a graph. API, so it doesn't sit on top of GraphQL, but um, we do uh, publish a, uh, a schema for our API according to the open API spec. And um, maybe Ankur or Kaz could say more about what you can do with, with our spec. Yeah, so the open API spec is, spec is available on a GitHub repository, so you can grab the, the sometimes a little bit uh, not up to date, but the, you can check those, uh, those you know, metadata. And also you can check the SDK's uh, data definition that, they, that may be helpful to understand what types of data will be returned from the API. So the GitHub repository is under the Git Slack API organization on GitHub. So that is a really good, way, good, good place to check to know about it. Yeah. So I, I guess many people would know about this anyway, but I just put the question there just in case. Um, so anyway, let's see. Um, we're waiting for that question. Okay. So one question um, you can see from the chat um, about success metrics and who owns the APIs. So I'm not sure if that's related to your own organization or or John's organization. Yeah. A recommendation for his organization. So at Slack, we have multiple sets of APIs that are. Uh, not just for things like publishing notifications to Slack, but also things for mm -hmm. governing your workspace. So for example, if you want to provision users at scale, we have a skim API for that. We also have a, a discovery API that is built for uh, in the case you need to do any sort of legal hold or, um, or data loss prevention on the contents of your Slack workspace. So there are different teams, of course, that build those core products and they build the corresponding APIs. But at Slack, we have a single uh, API advisory council that looks at all the APIs holistically to see how they hang together as a suite. Because we know that to our end customers, 
they don't care what team at Slack built the API, but they do care that they have a consistent, easy experience using it. So organizationally, the, each product team is responsible for the extensibility of their product, but we do have a central body that helps with API governance across all of them. So is there like a central owner? It sounds quite decentralized. Uh, it is it is quite decentralized, but that review yeah. board does uh, does give advice about how we roll things out to developers and what consistency means across these various API suites. Good, good. Okay, so I hope that answers John's question. We have a DMS question now, which I guess you can read. <laughs> uh, how can we summarize this? It sounds like you want to do a deprecation, um, but you've got limited resources and it, it sounds like the deprecation would be difficult, but also building the new thing would be difficult. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd start with like, why do you want to get rid of the old tech stack? I mean, it, the one reason that we see here in your question is that the, the previous API has probably some outdated tech. Um, but I think there's a lot of examples in our industry of like companies that are using relatively non-sophisticated technology, right? Like there's amazing new programming languages and, you know, Kubernetes and all these like cool technologies that we all want to play with as developers. And sometimes there's a temptation to rewrite something just because of the, the new shininess of the new technology. But there's also tons of companies that are built on technology that's been around for decades. Like for example, Slack went through a pretty slow evolution by the standards of, you know, just observing Silicon Valley tech. Um, so uh, when Slack started, it was, you know, it, you could we could not foresee that it would be what it is today. And it was written in PHP, which is considered a pretty easy language to get moving in, but not necessarily the most sophisticated or elegant language. Um, and over time, we've been slowly and surely evolving our code base to use hack. And that was, uh, that's for those who are unfamiliar with it, it is a stronger typed, um, I will say dialect of PHP. And, um, you know, we could have said, oh man, let's take up the time and the resources to rewrite the whole thing in Go or whatever we thought the, the latest craze was. But it was an intentional choice to choose to move to hack because the compatibility story between PHP and Hack is very strong. There's a clear line of evolution that we could traverse without disrupting the business, right? And so that's a key part of not having, uh, being limited in resources is you don't want to disrupt the business. And so I would say like, there are lots of ways to change your technology, but you should really try and learn, like it should, should be more than just for the sake of new tech. Cool, cool. So Dimas, I hope that gives some some insight. Um, Kazu, any any thoughts? Your your valuable experience. So, uh, yeah, that's so totally fine. And I totally agree with that. <laughs> Not only the she, the case of the Slack, but also we have we have been observing the similar situation in our tech companies. The the priority is not to replace the systems. The priority is to deliver delivering valuable uh, products to the customers and uh, keeping the you know stability of the API platform. So I think that's a matter of the priority. Yeah, yeah. So we got the response slowly, slowly changed. Hey, guys, we're already at the top of the session. All right. <laughs> I know you're busy. I would finish on time. I, I would say there's, I found this really interesting. And the, the for me, the most important thing here was take a step back, be really customer centric, consider the whole community. So many, so many takeaways. I don't think I could do it justice. So thanks, thanks very much. Yeah. So much. Right. Yeah, really cool. Um, hey, don't disturb, <laughs> don't disturb the business. So, so, yeah, there's a, there's an art to this, isn't it? That's, that's that's what I'm sensing here. There's a definite technology and science, but also an art, and it's a people focused art as well, and it involves everyone. So fantastic. Um, well, um, to, to everyone who participated, I think we'll just hang around here for a little bit, if that's okay, just for a minute, a couple of minutes, just in case Yeah, have to soak it all in. But with that, I'll just formally thank everybody and uh, wish everybody a good day. Okay. Thanks so much. All right, cheers. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks, everyone.
I'll let, I'll, let the, I'll let the speakers go, but the chat will still be open. Yeah. Okay. Cheers and have a good day. Bye.